if you think about the Sunnah, the Hadith, or the Prophet, right, then it's perfectly acceptable in Islamic science to question whether a Hadith is valid or not, right, whether it's real. There's a huge science around determining which are the valid and invalid Hadith, and you can go back and revisit that and question it and say, no, I think that's not a reliable Hadith. That is a reliable Hadith. I'll look at the... Right? You can, you can exercise that scrutiny with regard to the Sunnah of the Prophet all you want, and you're, you're not offending anybody, okay? As Christians can with the Bible. But you don't look at the Quran that way, right? The Quran, the Quran doesn't, isn't subject to that scrutiny because it is the immediate revelation of God. In the same way, if Christians would realize the Quran is not to be subject to the scrutiny that we would give to our Bible and realize that our Bible is more like the Sunnah of the Prophet, then I think we could have a better conversation about revelation. By the way, the same thing's true of Judaism. You know, The Christian Old Testament is the same as the Jewish Bible, right? But because for interpretive reasons, we interpret it completely differently. So I always tell my, my students, the Christian Old Testament and the Jewish Bible are two completely different books that merely happen to have the same words. <laughs> but our attitudes towards the, the ad, Christian attitude towards the Old Testament and the Jewish attitudes towards the Old Testament are so completely different that it's really two different books that happen to have the same words. Okay. Is there any Western country that's doing a better job than the United States is? And secondly, as a classicist, uh, you mentioned that the break was about 200, 250 years yeah. ago. Uh, I would push it back further than yeah. that uh, to the uh, Greeks with the break of the cosmological myth, mm -hmm. which deeply influences all uh, philosophy in general. Yeah, <coughs> yeah, and I don't, I wouldn't argue with that. I, I pick the Enlightenment as a convenient date, but the, there, w there would have been no Enlightenment without the Renaissance discovery of the Greeks, and so. Um, let me say one other thing about that. That's a, that reminds me by the fact, that, by the way, that all of these, all efforts to reconstruct the history that says who's responsible for what really can fall on the rocks pretty quickly. Um, one, of the, one of the great fallacies of history is to assume that because something is chronologically prior, it is the cause, right? And, um, and that's not always true. You know, there's multiple causes for things. Um, and that can work that can work in, in a number of ways. Um, I, I heard a, an author who really wanted to say some positive things about the Islamic contribution to the sciences uh, about a week ago at a, the medieval and post-medieval Muslim studies society in Dallas. I'm not sure what it, it, they might as well just say everything from the 10th century onward. I, but um, he really wanted to say some positive things, but he made his argument, he took his argument too far. Um, and it, only a day, and I thought he was taking it too far, and then only a day later I was reading something that pointed out that one of the things that he attributed to a 10th century Muslim scholar was very well established in second, second century, common era, before the common era, Greek philosophy, and was probably the source of that particular Muslim scholar's <laughs> insights. So it, it happens that, that that Muslim scholar may have mediated that through Spain to Europe, but he, he wasn't the source. So that, that's a good reminder of that. Now, is any country doing it better than the U.S.? Well, I don't know every country in the world. I guess I would say that I thought Austria did a pretty good job. I, I, when I lived in Austria, I lived in Austria seven years, and I lived in a 60% Turkish neighborhood. <laughs> um, it, was, it was far, far easier to get Turkish food and olives than it was to get anything Austrian. Um, but that was actually a good thing. You know, I mean, Austria doesn't have a lot. Schnitzel, what can you say? Um, but uh, I think Austria managed it pretty well. Unlike Germany, Austria allowed Muslims to become citizens after 10 years of legal residence. Um, so they didn't have this integraciones problem they talk about because you don't have a permanent five generations of second class citizens sort of thing. Um, and they were very careful to manage dialogue in, in, in the neighborhoods and stuff like that. Um, by American standards, the Austrian government was a bit interventionist. That is to say, it set up dialogues like in my district, in our precinct, it tried to get the Muslims together with, you know, others. Um, that's the best I can, I can say. Yeah. Well, I was just thinking of the UK model. Yeah. Where they're very open, the archbishop is very open. Yeah. 
the more he tries to further the two religions into to get apart, yeah. And I'm not sure, the problem, I mean, the, the problem with comparing the U.S. to the U.K. is that the U.K. has such a different attitude towards religion. Um, I mean, Americans are much more religious than the English are, in general. I don't know if you have any idea how much more. They're much, much more than Austrians. You know, the, the joke in us Methodists, I mean, there were only 1,200 Methodists in all of Austria, okay? Um, my, my church had about 250 people in it, and it was by far the biggest Protestant congregation going. Um, so that, and nobody went to the Catholic churches. They were all empty museums. So the, the joke in Austria was that the Austrians believe there's only one true religion, and they hate it. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> um, it would, I guess I would speak personally. I think if our American religious leaders, and by that I mean our bishops and stuff, across the line, would become more involved in interfaith dialogue, that it would be a good thing. Um, but of course the government, um, I, I have not seen the US government or county or city governments very much involved in this. Plano is, I don't know about Houston. We've got one city up in North Dallas that has, a, has really tried to engage its community in this, but I don't think we do a very good job. We leave, it's just like everything else, it's a free enterprise system, and if the IAD doesn't pull in and do it, then nobody does. Help, I'm sorry. Uh, in the issue that or the um, categories of uh, uh, that you identified yeah. uh, where there is need for dialogue, uh, it appears to me that on, on the issues where Muslims take a particular view, they actually uh, care a lot with some Christian denominations or yes. some Christian individuals. Mm -hmm. But uh, Muslims seem to be at, at a higher risk of being singled out and being seen as different mm -hmm. uh, than fellow Christians. So. What do you think are the factors affecting that? Okay, that's a, that's a good observation, I think. Um, yes, uh, where Muslims in many ways have the most in common, both in terms of worldview and values, is with conservative evangelical Christians and with Orthodox Jews. Um, now, <laughs> which are two groups that have not shown a notable interest in interfaith dialogue, okay? or an affinity to Muslims at all. And, and, but let me explain why I think that is. Um, right now, and I, I say this as a person who lived outside of the United States for 20 years, and so when I came back it was kind of a culture shock, okay? In my view, right now, conservative American Christianity is as much about an American identity as it is